Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We're talking about Paul's uh, letter to the church at Rome. And uh, we're in, we started in the chapter 8 last week. So we've covered uh, sin, why well, we need righteousness. We've covered salvation, where righteousness has been imputed. We've covered sanctification where righteousness is imparted, and that's where we are right now in the chapter 8. We've covered chapters 6 and 7. Of course, we've covered all the previous chapters of the book of Romans. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Romans, the 8th chapter, as we continue in our journey with the life and teachings of Paul. Paul is in Corinth writing. He's been there for several months writing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go ahead and back up, back to the verse, verse 1 of this chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And we've talked about this, that, you know, there are those who say from the minuscule, uh, or minuscule uh, manuscripts that this phrase, who walk not after the spirit, but after the flesh, or, I mean, after the flesh, but after the spirit, are not in the original. And the problem is they are in the, the majority text. They're not in the minority text, so there's disagreement. Most of our modern translations have been taken from the revised version, which was taken from the minority text. So uh, I'm a, almost every translation that's modern now uses the RV as a basis to work from uh, in its research. So... Um, there's going to be continuity because that's what they're using. King James used the majority text, and, um, you know, what we do is we say this. It's, it's in verse 1, but it's also in verse 4, and since it's all working together, it's there. All right? Hallelujah. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. And, I, again, if you don't walk in this flesh, you won't be condemned. And will not God condemn you. Your own heart will condemn you if you walk in sin. Um, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Um, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now listen, if you're... Uh, even as a born-again believer, and Paul said some things. He's, remember, he said back in chapter 6, we're no longer under the dominion of the nature of sin. We are walking or living or born into a whole new plane altogether. But he also comes back behind that and says, but if you yield your members as servants of unrighteousness, then that's what's going to dominate you. Because whoever you yield yourself to will have or lord over you, have control over you. But the law of sin or the nature of sin cannot constrain you, cannot make you obey it. When you were dead, uh, dead to righteousness and alive unto sin, sin constrains you. Sin had, dom had dominion, had authority to force you to obey it. You sinned. Why? Because that's what you did. And really, anything you could do to stop it. And when the, when the law came, all they could do is tell you how sinful you were because you, you couldn't keep the law. And then people came along and said, well, you know, now I'm under grace. It doesn't matter what I do because I'm going to heaven anyway. But when Jesus came, I think Jesus knew something about grace. I, I'm just guessing. The head of the church, second person of the Godhead, God manifests in the flesh. I think he knows a little bit about the subject of grace. Could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he knew something. And when he came, he didn't say, go ahead and do whatever you want to. It doesn't matter. He said, man, if you look at a woman you to lust after her, you committed adultery. He said, the law says if you commit it, you know, that's a problem. But he said, I'm telling you, if you look at her and think about it, you've already done it. He raised the standard. He didn't lower it. That went over big. Can I get a couple of grunts? That's all I want out of you. My favorite baseball team, Oakland. Lost in 12 innings last night to Kansas City. I get a text this afternoon. How about them Royals? 
the person that sent it got back, strike three, you're out. <laughs> so his Dr. Pepper's in glass bottle, the one that I was going to give him, he just is not going to get now. I will drink it in celebrating the Kansas City victory. They that are after the flesh. If you walk after the flesh, you're going to mind the things. Of the if you give yourself to fleshly things, you're going to be mindful of fleshly things. They that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And that's why we are told... Um, Paul writes over in Romans, the 12th chapter, and says that we're to renew our mind, break, you know, be, uh, be not conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Because the carnal mind can't be subject to the law of God. It has to have a metamorphosis. It has to be transformed. James said, receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is, which is able to save, or uh, the, the word save is sozo. It's out of the sozo word group. Means to, and also means to restore or make whole your soul, your suke. So James says, receive the word so it will restore or make sound your suke. Here, you know, the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity. It's an opposition to God. When you get saved, your mind didn't get saved. Your mind still can be screwed up. And some, being around some of the Christians I've been around over the years, they are still messed up. They need to renew their mind to the word of God. Amen. And not to what Brother Dum Dum has to say. <clears throat> If Brother Dum Dum doesn't tell you what the Bible says, he's Dum Dum. I feel it coming on tonight. I feel a spirit of meddling. Hallelujah. Messing in people's business. Hallelujah. Y'all here, you go home. <clears throat> but I said, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. Now, we said something interesting he said here. He says, they that are in the sphere of the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the sphere of the fle spirit flesh. You're in the sphere of the spirit. Now, remember, we read back over in chapter 6 how that J.B. Phillips said that when we got saved, we, walked in a, we, we, we came or were brought into a whole new plane altogether. And that is the plane where we live out of all the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're to walk in newness of life. We walk in a whole new plane altogether. Yet he comes back behind that and reiterates that if you yield yourself, now what is this? The law, the, the, the realm of the, that we're called to, the realm that we've been raised to, raised us up together, made us sit together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter 2. That realm that we've been called up to, is where we're to abide. Yet Paul says, don't yield your members as servants of unrighteousness. What? Don't come down from the place that we're called to. Don't come down and subject yourself to the laws that you once walked in, the laws of sin and death, the laws where the nature of sin has dominion. And Paul says here, we're not in that sphere. We weren't, we weren't brought into that sphere. But you can put yourself back down there if you want to. You can go walk in it. Paul says, don't yield your members that way, okay? So, but if you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of God, he's none of his. Now, see, he's saying, if you, don't have the Holy, if you don't have the spirit of Christ in you, you're not God's. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Here he's, see, Paul is kind of summing this up and reminding us that we're to, remember, we're to count ourselves indeed dead to sin, not sins. We're to count ourselves dead to the dominion of the nature of sin. It cannot constrain us. In other words, you can't pull a Flip Wilson and say, the devil made me do it, honey. Some of y'all remember Flip Wilson and his alter ego, uh, Geraldine. Geraldine said, the devil made me do it. She was a bad girl. And I always blame the devil. Well, Believers are reminded to count themselves dead. In other words, dead men do not have to obey. I mean, if, if you're dead and the cop comes here and says, hold your hands up, you don't have to obey. Actually, you can't. So you reckon yourselves dead to the dominion of the nature of sin, and you don't have to obey it anymore. 
You're free from that. Okay? <clears throat> so if Christ being you, the body is dead. In other words, if you go back to 6, you'll find out. And then, of course, 7, Paul talks about, I call, I call it jokingly the schizophrenic chapter. It's really not. It's Paul talking about what it's like to be saved and not know how to deal with your flesh. See, the new creation, he, but then he learns that in Christ Jesus, he has authority. You're dead to sin. Count yourself dead to sin. Amen? And if Christ is in you, the body is yet. In other words, the, the appetites of the nature of sin that's in the body. I mean, finally, your body's not redeemed. If you haven't found that out, you got saved when you walked through the door and you ain't had enough time. Your body's, your body's not redeemed. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, the, the promise of the glorious possession, uh, the seal of the Holy Ghost is on the promise, the, the promise redemption is for your body. Then in that day when Jesus comes back, this corruptible shall put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality, we change in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And we which are alive and, and, and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. But the dead in Christ shall rise first. And the, we which are alive shall be caught up in the air with them, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. At that point in time, there is the fulfillment of the, the fullness of the plan of redemption, and that is the completion of the redemption of your body. Your spirit's already saved. Your mind is in the renewing process, and your body's got a promise of Jesus coming back and getting the new one. Woo! Hallelujah! Was that Kristen? Lord, help me with that child. Christ being you, your body is dead. Ever say, my body's dead if Christ is in me. That, thank you, well, at least one said it. What does that mean? That means you cannot, you, your body can't make you do stuff. I just couldn't help myself. That's a lie. Why? When you understand that your body cannot dominate you because Christ is in you, you reckon or count your body dead indeed unto sin. It no longer has the right to rule or to dominate you. Amen. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Amen. But if the Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. The word quicken means make alive. Now, we, this, this is a twofold thing. One is the ultimate promise of the redeemed body. But also that the light that's in you, the life of God that's in you, the life of Christ in you, Christ dwelling in you can put, produce life in your body. Health, wholeness, longevity, amen, overcoming uh, the things of the flesh of this world. The life of God quickens it. Although you're not, you don't get the full redemption, you got a promise of that, the life of God in you can cause you to dominate your flesh and make it do right. And live right and live healthy. Amen. It doesn't, you know, some people say, well, if you, don't, if you don't get sick, how are you going to die? Heard that before. Do like they did in the Old Testament. Call them all in, lay hands on them, curse them or bless them, depending on how they're living, throw up your feet and go. Hallelujah. Take off. I got some testimonies of old saints. Just called the family in, said, I'm going home today, and went. Amen. Tell them in advance, I'm going home. Um, I remember one minister, he got up from his church. You know, he had a church, but he, he merely his, one of his, his, uh, his children pastored it. He was traveling all over the world doing stuff for the Lord and been a lifelong missionary. And uh, got up on the, the last Sunday he preached, said, the, you know, the, this is paid off, and that's paid off, and this is paid off. Just listed, listed all things about the ministry, millions of dollars worth of stuff. They were all paid off. He said, I'll see you on the other side. Went home that week. Well, within 10 days, he went home. Took off. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just, let everybody, just told everybody. About Brother Hayden got in, in, in Winter Bible Seminar 2003. People said they didn't, they didn't get it until he died. Then they realized he went back and listened to the tapes. He was telling everybody goodbye. So they, they, they just didn't get it because, you know, it was expecting him to live longer. He's telling everybody goodbye. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But see, the, you know, if the Spirit of Christ, if the Spirit of Jesus, that raised Jesus up for the dead, dwell in you, he'll, 
He that raises them up from the dead shall also quicken what, what kind of body? Your mortal body. He, you're not, now listen, the manifest of sons of Christ doctrine that came out, in the, or, or, the, or, or it was the manifest of sons of God, and uh, uh, the kingdom now came out about 20 years later, or 30, you know, 25 years later, that, you know, we're all going to have a glorified body here on the earth. The enlightened ones are going to get it. Now, he said here that the Spirit of God raised Jesus up from the dead that dwells in you will make alive or produce life in your mortal body. did say he would change it at that time. But his life was going to work in that mortal body, and it was going to give you longevity. It was going to give you health. It was going to do things where your body didn't have to dominate you. It was going to be, life was going to affect it. Because when Jesus comes back, you get an immortal, glorified, incorruptible body. Yeah, hallelujah. Amen. Can you say amen? I just think, you know, we, we're, it's, a, it's an exciting thing. <clears throat> I said it's a glorious thing. God's life in us is doing all kinds of wonderful things. Stop trying to make it do stuff that God didn't say it was going to do. Why? Because you'll be disappointed. I, I, I just, I, I wish I could read it. Maybe I can. It might fit in here. <laughs> I've got a good friend. I love my good friend stuff. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who, who said something? It was, it was great. It was a great post. Hallelujah. See, we got preachers that are, how many read Facebook? I declare that all the demons in hell and all the just controlling spirits and this and that and all of that are not going to bother you today and you're just going to be free. Just, just a random post. By what authority did that everybody's life? Did Jesus do that where he went? Did Jesus walk into a town and say, I demand all the controlling spirits of this town to be broken off of everybody's life? You ever see Jesus doing that? The guy done it. <laughs> I love guy. Said this today. I believed the soul stirring message of a preacher who prophesied and declared that God was going to fight all my battles for me. And that I needed all I needed to do was stand and watch the rest. Glory, amen, hallelujah. So I removed my helmet, took off my breastplate, set down my shield, and retired my sword, said the dead man. Why did God give us the sword, the, the weapons, the armor of God, if we don't have to do anything? He said, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. So somebody comes along, I declare that you're not going to have any trouble from the devil in Jesus' name. All those powers are broken. You're liberated. You're, you know, and they say stuff, and then we come along and start buying into stuff that the Bible doesn't say. And we wonder why the devil come along, comes along and puts our feet where our head was two seconds before. Because we were, we were free because so-and-so said we were. No, what the Bible promises, let us walk in. What the Bible tells us to do, let us do it. If it tells us to fight the good fight of faith, fight the good fight of faith. If it doesn't tell us that you can prophesy and declare everybody that they're free and they ain't never going to have any more trouble with the devil and all this kind of stuff, then don't go tell people that. <clears throat> but it stirs people up emotionally and it gets offerings. Yeah, I, pray, I love to hear them because it makes me feel so good. I'm going to send them some money. You better stop sending folks money who don't tell you what the Bible says. Amen. All right. If the Spirit of God that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body. Now, you can't tell people that they're going to have a glorified body on the earth when the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, <clears throat> this corruptible shall put on the incorruptible. This mortal shall put on immortality. We'll be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And then here, Romans 8 tells us, but according to the Apostle Paul, and I think Paul knew what he was talking about. He knew a man about 13, 14 years ago, called up into the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, he couldn't tell, which heard things unlawful to be uttered. And so it took him the rest of his life to write it out in what we call his epistles. The things he couldn't utter, he wrote them out. It took him a long time, but he finally got it out. Amen. Now he calls your body mortal. 
The life is going to affect your mortal body. That means it's going to give you life forever. Remember, Jesus said what, to Peter, what is it if he stay until I return again? Amen. You feed my sheep. And then in the rumor, and even the Bible says, and the rumor went out that he, that he, he, he was going to live until Jesus came back. I remember when I first got saved, there were people going around telling everybody that, that John was still alive somewhere because Jesus said he was going to stay here until he came back. You always have somebody who believes that. There's always a group of people saying that kind of stuff. Well, if you read the rest of it, John discounts that. And he said, simply, he was saying, what is it to you if I want that? You do what I tell you to do. In other words, don't worry about John. See, people get a hold of stuff and run off the deep end. No. The life of God will affect your body. It can make your body well. It can give you longevity. But the Bible still doesn't promise you your body won't die unless you're alive when Jesus comes back. Amen. When Jesus comes back, we which are alive and remain at that time. In other words, if you're alive at that time, you will not prevent or go before the ones that are asleep, but the dead in Christ shall rise first. He didn't say, you'd say you can all turn into man, the, the God's manifested sons and walk around on the planet, and you know, when you go to kingdom now, kind of like the mothership for the New Agers. It was the Christian New Age doctrine. And it's, it wasn't even based on anything biblical. That's, that's the thing. See, the church gets a bad name because of Looney Tunes. Hello? I mean, you got Porky, that's right, Porky the Pig up there making all the noises, you know? She shall quicken your mortal bodies about the spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brother, now let's, he just made that statement. Thank God for the life that it produces in our bodies. Can you say Amen. Thank God there's a living one on the inside of us that can, that can cause our bodies to be well and cause our bodies to live healthy. But it doesn't mean you're, going, you're not going to ever die. Should Jesus tarry long enough, you will die. Physically. Dad Hagen used to say, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. And the way you're ready to die is you know the Lord Jesus Christ. You have him come into your heart. You're born again. The life of God's on the inside of you. His nature has been deposited into you. Glory be to God. Now live your life out to the fullest. And when it's time and you've lived out a full long life, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. Glory to God. Call the kids in. Bless them. Whatever. And then throw your feet up and go home. At a ripe old age. Go home healthy. Go home, you know, sound. But you're going to go home. Be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. You're, gonna, you're not going to live <coughs> four, 500 years. Amen. The best we've been able to find out that the Bible, uh, after, after the fall of man and the, you know, the process of time, that God gave the promise of 70, 80, but, you know, that uh, for covenant people, that 125. I always like to tell people I'm on the 125 rapture plan, whichever comes first. It's like that 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty on your car, whichever one comes first. 10 years, but you never make it to 10. Your car's got 100,000 on it in six. If you drive it enough, all right? I'm on the 125 rapture plan. 125 years of rapture, whichever comes first. Because I can tell you, if Jesus comes back, I don't care if I'm 40. I'm leaving. Of course, I passed 40. <clears throat> I mean, maybe I got in a time machine and went back. But you know, if Jesus comes back when I'm 75, I'm not, oh, I got 50 more years, Lord. No, I'm out of here, man. All right. Now, but, but Paul, remember this, we're, we're, we're not just talking about these things. What Paul is ma majoring on, what Paul is focusing on is uh, the battle or the ability. Uh, one, you know, one study guy says we're talking about sanctification here. Now, some people don't like to hear that word in the church. And the reason you don't want to hear sanctification in, in the church is because you want to do sin. That's the only reason. The only reason you don't want to talk about sanctification and living a holy life is because you want to sin. And I've got to say this. If you want to sin, there's a problem. If you're looking for ways to sin and to get away with it, there's a problem. Oh, you're legalistic. Oh, I'm turning him off. He's not preaching grace. He's not preaching I'm free. Yeah, no, no, no. Sin has a price. Charles Finney said, sin is the most costly, um, what, how do you say, most, is, sin costs more than anything. So sin costs more than anything. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Sin costs. 
Sin doesn't pay. <clears throat> Believers, see, people take, take one side of something that we're righteous, that we've been freed from the dominion of sin, that the life of God's in us, you know, that we're secure in the Father, and they want to take that and push it to an extreme where it doesn't matter what you do, yet it does matter what you do. Paul is talking and ministering and sharing how to live a sanctified life. What do you mean sanctified? Separated. Come out from among them and touch ye not the unclean things, saith the Lord. That doesn't mean you can't go minister to sinners. It means that they're not your best bud. Amen. Said this Sunday. You don't go clubbing with them. They're a ministry project. Hello? Well, we're going to go out and we're going to drink. I'm just going to drink, you know, uh, light beer or near beer or, uh, yeah, I know a guy did that and he started right back to drinking. He, he, he ran a pizza place and he loved the taste of pizza and beer. Why? I like pizza and Coke, but pizza and beer. And people say, you got to acquire a taste for it. If you've... If you've got to acquire a taste for it, why are you drinking it? It's like eating chitlins. Anybody ever had chitlins? I'm telling you right now. If you've got to cook your food in another town and bring it back over somewhere else to eat it, there's something wrong. I've had, I, I, my grandma used to cook chitlins. You, could, you couldn't even stay in there. You'd go outside in the middle of the winter with no coat on just to get out of the house. And then she sit down. I mean, I'm thinking, my goodness, did you get any corn? Some of y'all get that later. They didn't get them cleaned out enough. Down South Carolina, they have a chitlin festival sometime. They cook the chitlins in another town 30 miles away and truck them over. Why? Well, because the they wouldn't have anybody there. The odor is so bad. Well, this guy got, you know, drinking what they call near beer. It was like less than a half a percent content. It's supposed to be basically, basically for all practical intents purposes, non-alcoholic. Next thing you know, drinking regular beer, backslid, divorced. <clears throat> we want to live in a different place. I want to live in the place where I don't need to be inebriated to be at peace. I don't need my different this or different that to get peace. I want to live in the realm of the Spirit where the tranquility of the Holy Ghost comes on me, where He settles down on us. Oh, hallelujah. Can you say amen? And in that place, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Man, there's nothing. Jack Daniels ain't got nothing on the Holy Ghost. Amen. Are you here? Matt Dog 2020 don't have anything on the Holy Ghost. Because I can tell you, they can get you inebriated and you can forget about it and, and wet yourself and do all kinds of nasty stuff. Because yeah. you're so drunk. But you can get into the presence of God. And the peace that comes there passes all understanding. And then when, when that, that, that presence or that, that particular anointing lifts, you don't have dry, cotton mouth. You don't have, you know, the sweats. You don't have all the other stuff. You don't have the hangover. You've been with God. Matter of fact, in that place, there's answers given. Direction given insight, revelation comes. Oh, my, 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 my. Yeah, go, ahead, go ahead and party and act like you're cool drinking with all the people. I'd rather be in my prayer closet with praying in the Holy Ghost with the Spirit of God on my life so that when I come out, there's a fragrance of His presence. Can you say amen? Therefore, brethren, verse 12, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. You are not in debt. To you. you owe your flesh nothing. Can I say this? Your flesh wants to do it. What? Whatever it is it shouldn't do. 
it wants to do it. You're not a debtor to obey it. It has no legal recourse to force you into obedience. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You're to, you're to take the Holy Ghost, live in that new plane, and tell your flesh, shut up and sit down, boy. For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now listen, you can be a child of God and not be a son. You can be born of God and not be one of his sons. not walking in sonship. You can be a relative, but you're not walking in the sonship. That's a different place. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again for fear, but you received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We didn't receive the spirit of bondage. Why would you want to go back into the very things God delivered you from? Now, let me say something. It is a natural response to want to ask Egypt. We preached the beginning of the year, Egypt just ain't all that. There is a cry from your flesh to go back to what you knew. Your flesh desires to be fleshly. It's because it's not born again. That's because it's not glorified. That's because it's not redeemed. You got to, as we said later, we'll find out in Romans chapter 12, that you got to offer it as a living sacrifice. You got to keep that rascal down. Why? Because it'll rise up and do ugly. That's just what it likes to do. But we receive the spirit of adoption where we call Abba or Daddy, Father. The spirit itself or himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Notice it doesn't bear witness with your flesh. Folks, it ain't whether or not you got a Holy Ghost goose bump or not. Amen. The Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit you're a child of God. Amen. And if children heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy uh, to be compared with the glory which we, uh, shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestations of the sons of God. See, people took that out and went out and started talking about being the manifested sons of God. We're not the manifested sons of God yet. We're not manifest fully as sons of God. We've got to promise redemption. Our bodies are still goofy. I said our bodies are still goofy. Your body, if you let it, will go out and do goofy stuff. And you have to tell it no. And you have the authority to tell it no. And you don't have to lay down and let it do what it wants to do. And you don't have to say, I can get away with doing what it wants to do because I'm under grace. That's just stupid. You will reap a just recompense and reward if you do that. You might not go to hell, but you sure won't be enjoying what you're doing when you're on the way to heaven. And you won't like it when the Lord gets you into heaven and talks to you about it. And all your rewards get shifted over to me. I don't like what he preached. I got your rewards. It went over big. Well, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by the reason of him who has subjected him, the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not they only, but ourselves also, which are the first, have the, had the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, that is, to, to know the redemption of our body. <clears throat> so Paul brings it. He, he even talks about the body as like a, a separate entity. Why? Because it is. In the sense that your spirit is the, is the real you. Your body is your earth, so you've got to have it to live here. Your soul is your will, your mind, your intellect, your emotions. We groan for the redemption of our bodies. Wouldn't it be great if we had the glorified, immortal, incorruptible bodies walk around, didn't ever think about sin, didn't ever have to deal with sin, never. I mean, <clears throat> you could put your body out in the backyard and turn it loose and it wouldn't do anything wrong. Wouldn't that be great? Take it out and just turn it loose, tell it to do whatever it wants to do, and it will do stuff. Or at least try to do stuff. P 
people don't sit around one day and go, okay, today I will commit adultery. You don't wake up, walk out, and go, say, I'm going to find somebody to commit adultery with today. Woo! You know, I'm just going to let my body do what it wants to do. You've been letting the body dominate you. If your spirit's dominating you, if you're living in the realm altogether, the whole new place altogether, and you're controlling your flesh, and you're making your body a living sacrifice, then when those things come, you say, no! You're not going to do that. You're going to walk in this whole new realm altogether. The life of God in me is going to dominate you. You're going to, you're going to walk and manifest the Lord Jesus Christ in the earth, whether you like it or not, because I'm in charge. Body. And one day, sucker, you're going to die, and I'm going to get a new one. But until then, you will obey Master. Master, Master's do right. Master won't let us do anything. <laughs> All right, so anyway. Lord of the Rings, Gollum, Smeagol. Master, we like Master. How many of you have never seen Lord of the Rings? Has everybody seen it? All right. Nathan does a much better Gollum than I do. Anyway. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the redemption to wit or to know the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. Now, it says not your spirit is saved by hope. We are, our body is saved by hope. We have the hope of the purchased possession receiving the glorified body, the incorruptible, immortal body. That is a hope. Why? You can't experience it until Jesus comes back. Therefore, it can, you cannot by faith get it. The Word of God makes it clear. This is a hope. We have a hope of a resurrected body. Amen? But hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth. Why do they yet hope for it? But hope for that which we, that we see not, that we do with patience, wait for it. We, that's, he's talking about, here, you've got to understand, this passage is talking about controlling your body. We have to wait with patience for the redemption of our body. You're not going to get it on this side of heaven or before the rapture. You won't get it before then. What's that mean? You're going to have to control that rascal. See, this is, this is where the teaching that comes in. People start teaching about what our spirit is and try to apply it to our body. Well, you're under grace, so it doesn't matter what you do. See, yeah, you're, you're, under, you're under a grace or a gifting or empowerment, but it does matter what you do. And your body has to be kept because it's, we're waiting in patience for the hope of its redemption. Your spirit's already born again. I'm not waiting to get born again, but I'm waiting for my glorified body where the appetites and the dictates of it don't control and dominate or drive or push or aggravate or con constantly work against you. Amen. Where you just walk through the wall. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Clark Kent ain't got nothing on us with the glorified body. All right. Likewise, the Spirit also helps with our weaknesses. For we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, or as the translation, uh, other translations say, uttered in articulate speech. What's he talking about? How do we know how to pray as we ought? How do you pray about the control of your body? That is why Jude says we're to build ourselves up in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's why Paul says, we, you know, the Spirit himself helpeth our infirmities. Takes hold together with us against our weaknesses, our infirmities. What? When you pray in the Spirit, you empower the inner man. You empower him by the power of the Holy Ghost to say no to the flesh. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Charge. Charge like a battery, the Greek really is saying. He edifieth himself. Builds himself up. See, we need to be built up. We need to be telling people how to control the flesh, not telling people it's okay to turn it loose. 
See, the, the good news is there's a way to dominate and, and, and control your flesh and keep it from doing what it wants to do and obey you and walk with, so you can walk with God. Instead of don't feel guilty that you're letting it do all this other stuff. Because really what you're doing is you're bringing them into condemnation ultimately. Three grunts and a help me Jesus, please. He that searches the hearts knows it's with the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Now stop here. You can't take that out of this context and run off and make it say your child getting run over by a Mack truck worked together for your good. It's not even the context. It's not even what's being talked about here. He's talk, he just got through saying the Spirit helps you pray and take hold against your infirmities and all things work together for your good to them that love God and call according to his purpose. And then he goes on and says, For whom he foreknow, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who shall be against us? Take the whole thing in context. Now, number one, I do believe in predestination based on foreknowledge. I don't believe in predestination that you were designed to go to hell and that's just the way it's going to be and nothing you can do about it. But I do believe that the Bible says for whom he foreknew, he did he predestined. Well, there you go. How can you go to say some of the stuff that people say on predestination when the Bible makes it clear it's based on God's for, God foreknowing who would receive Jesus? Amen. He didn't make them receive Jesus. He knew, he knew who would. Foreknowledge is the basis of biblical predestination teaching. Not you're predestined to go to hell, you're predestined to go to heaven. Ain't nothing you can do to change it. That's just the way it's going to be. If that were true, then, God, then we got a scripture problem because the Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Then you're going to have to say everybody's getting saved because if, 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 God says, if God's not willing that any should perish and that all should come to the knowledge of the truth, then everybody's going to get saved. But that's not true either. He's not willing that they should, but you have to walk in the will of God in agreement. Somebody else say amen. All right. So the Spirit helpeth our weaknesses, for we know not how to pray as we ought. The Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God or according to God. His prayer for you is going to be in line with God's will. Now Romans tells us, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know, that you may know his good, perfect, and acceptable will. God's will is good, God's will is perfect, and God's will is acceptable. So if the Holy Spirit's going to pray for you according to the will of God, it's going to be good. So when he comes back and says, and we know that all things work together for good, wait a second, it's going, he's been praying for you according to the will of God. He's not praying for you that you're going to get your baby killed so he can teach you something. Hello. God is a good God. Amen. See, judge, I, honestly, I honestly take the stance, to, to mostly, to mostly take the stance that the judgment of God was really not reserved for man. It was reserved for Satan and, his, and the fallen angels who rebelled against him. And the only reason man gets in on it is because he's attached to it. If you stay with Satan, you get, you get cooked. Remember when Moses, you know, God gave the opportunity. So Moses said, everybody come, wants to be with God, come over here. They came over through the stones and all the people got swallowed up. Why? Well, they chose to stay in that place. They chose not. They did not choose to come over with God. Amen? And so we have to understand that the flesh... The things that God, so all the things that work together for our good to them that love God and call according to his purpose, we get this idea that God does all kinds of mean stuff to his kids. God's just knocking his kids out. <laughs> Thank you for the fresh water. Oh, fresh. Hallelujah. 
What time is it? Yeah. I'm just warming up. He just, listen to this. If, what should we say these, uh, to these things? Remember, he just got through saying, if you know, all things work together for good, to them that call, the, the, uh, love God to call according to his purpose, that he foreknow, he predestined, that we could be formed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among, he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he called, he called, he justified, he justified, he glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That does not sound like he's killing our youngins or giving cancer or age or something to somebody, teaching some secret lesson that nobody ever figures out. I've listened to a bunch of people talk about their, you know, their kid dying. The Lord, you know, people told them, oh, the Lord knew what he was doing. And, you know, all the different things that people tell people. And, uh, and, and they never did learn the lesson. What lesson? That's the, what we're trying to figure out. What lesson is it you're supposed to learn? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. God's not withholding any good thing from us. Who shall lay anything in the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is at the right hand of God. And, uh, but listen, who makes intercession for us? He's got the right to condemn you, but he's praying for you. So I've said this over and over and over again. The Lord's not condemning you. Your own heart condemns you. When you sin, you're not, God doesn't have to condemn you. Your own heart will do it. So what do you do? Repent. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul begins to summarize all of this. He's telling us not to, not, not to let our flesh have domination, to keep our flesh under. And then he comes back and begins to talk about that the Spirit of God. You know, here's the beautiful thing. He tells us what not to do. And then he tells us how to accomplish it. Now, it's not enough to say, if you commit adultery, you're going to hell. How do I not? Well, you keep your, you keep your flesh, you reckon your flesh dead and dealing to sin. You live in that whole new plane altogether. But that's tough. But the Spirit himself helpeth us. Three different Greek words combined as one word, and it means to take hold together with against. The Spirit comes as our aid, and in intercession and in prayer, He takes hold with us together against the weight of the pressure of the old nature of sin to try and, and the, the dominion of sin to try to come back into our life. As we pray in the Holy Ghost, as we pray in the Spirit, He takes hold together with us against that with groans that cannot be uttered in articulate speech. And he empowers us in the hour of weakness to rise up and say, I live in a different realm. He empowers us. And all things work together for our good. Not tragedy. That's not, that's not the context here. But the things of God, the, 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 the revelation, the Spirit helping us, works together for our good. Amen. Not tragedy. Amen. Because we love God and we're called according to his purpose. His empowerment and is there to lift us above the things that he, Roman, Hebrews chapter 12 says in verse 1. Therefore, seeing we're encompassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weights and the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How? As we get into that understanding that the, the sin has no longer got the power to constrain us, to make us to do things, we can begin to say no. And if, we, if we're having struggle, we can get into the Spirit and pray in the Spirit. And he takes hold together with us against that and then all things begin to work for our good because as the Spirit strengthens us and as we begin to run and we cut the fetters of, of weight and sin and we begin to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and run our race, we begin with patience 
patience to lay hold of the things of God and walk higher and higher and higher in the things of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can you say amen? And we walk free and, became, and get freer and freer. And the longer we stay there, the easier it is to do that. But every time that, 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 that nature of sin, the dominion of sin tries to reach up and pull us back down, we can go and get into the spirit and he'll take hold together with us against that thing. And Paul got to all this and, and kind of summarized it with, a, with a, uh, a, a triumphant verse saying, I am persuaded. See, Paul lived all these things. Kind of like David. David said, I was young and now I'm old. And I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. Now Paul begins to write things and say things in his letters after having lived a certain period of time. And he begins to write and he comes back here and he goes, you know what? I'm persuaded that neither that, that death or life. Angels or uh, principalities, powers, things present or things to come, height, debt, nor any other thing. It's going to be able to separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And he knows that in that place where God's love is favored upon him, the greater one rising up in him, the empowering of God's grace, the gift of empowerment to do what God wants you to do. It's not just favor that, you know, I have your favor. I have the favor of men in the world. It is God's empowerment. It is the favor of God in a sense that it empowers you to do what he's asked you to do. And as you yield to that and pray in the spirit and get, and get into the realm of the spirit and the Holy Spirit takes hold together with you against that stuff. Now, you walk in another realm. You walk in the realm that you're called to walk in. You walk in the realm of empowerment. You walk in the realm where the things and the, and the shackles and the fetters of the past. And listen, folks, notice I, I, we, we get, we, we're not going to get there in this letter, obviously. Um, but in Hebrews, lay aside the weight and the sin. <clears throat> what does that tell me? Weights are not necessarily and probably not even sin. But they'll, they'll, they'll entangle you. They'll trip you up. Golf is not a sin. But if you've got to be out there every Sunday morning instead of being at church, it's a weight. I'm going to tell you, you drinkers. Now, I, I've got some other stuff that, you know, I've got some, some enough stuff that I could go and say you don't need to drink. But let's just let's like take all that aside. If you've, got to have, if you've got to have alcohol, it's a weight. It may not even be a sin. It's at least a minimum a weight. Because you're using it to do what the Holy Spirit should be doing. You're replacing the Holy Spirit. But I like the flavor of it. Really, you like what it does to you. you even if you don't get sloppy drunk, you like what it does to your body. Instead of letting the whole, and so you're letting your body dictate how it gets relaxed. And your spirit gets nothing out of it. Whereas if you pray in the Holy Ghost, and you're, you're filled with the spirit by speaking to yourselves on psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You make melody in your heart to the Lord. Your flesh will get relaxed, but your spirit will reap great benefit. But it's easier. It's easier. It's easier. I said it's easier. It takes no effort. But you see that weight. And God doesn't want us encumbered with weights. Nor does he want us encumbered with sin. God wants us liberated to, to rise. To walk. As a deer panteth after the water, so my soul longeth after thee. I remember my graduation sermon from Ramah in 1981. We had some very uh, scarcely known minister preach our graduation. Or Roberts. <laughs> Brother Roberts preached my graduation from Ramah. And he preached tracking with God. And he talked about that we're the hind's feet. He used the scripture in the Old Testament about, you know, the, 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 the hind feet, you know, how the, when the deer runs, his front, front 
I guess hooves come down and when they come up the hind feet come up and land in the exact same spot and they push off and then the front feet come forward and hit and when they come back up the hind feet come up and land in the exact same spot my sermon this graduation sermon was tracking with God oh how it is when we walk with God when we walk in the spirit and he is leading us and guiding us and his his the, the front feet of God hit the ground and come up and then we come and step right in his place. The surety of knowing that every place where he, he lands in front of us, we land in behind and come in right behind him. That's where God wants us. God wants us tracking with him. And Satan will come and offer you a different track. The flesh will try to rise up and give you a different path. But there's nothing more beautiful and nothing more graceful than watching the deer run and boom, 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 over and over and over again. Tracking with God. God wants us in that place. Paul said that nothing will separate us from the love of God. Knowing this, that wherever he's leading you and you're tracking after him, it's always going to be good. Old Testament Psalm. Look over in the 23rd Psalm. We're going to go home. After we receive an offering. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, why is it people get over to the New Testament, read one scripture out of Romans, Really not in the context of how they use it. And all of a sudden, God's an evil mean, putting all kinds of stuff on you. And the psalmist has this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. <coughs> for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. That's prosperity, folks. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> Thank God that at least the Old, Old Testament psalmist knew what God was like. Paul chants, I'm persuaded. Neither death nor life nor uh, things past or things present and their angels nor principalities or powers or you know uh, things present or things to come uh, or any other thing shall separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus hallelujah so what are all those things they're all good things work together for your good getting beheaded does not work for your good hello amen we trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.